Fender's aftermarket overdrive install on this 71 Ford Torino. If you want to get caught up on what's been done to this point, click on the link in the description below for part one. So where part one left off was getting the gear vendors itself installed. Um, since then, I did have a drive shaft made and uh, I didn't talk about that process at all in part one, but it is obviously a very critical part of the job. Um, now you may elect to just take your old drive shaft and have it shortened. My old drive shaft needed new yokes. Um, the, the rear yoke was just worn out. And then the front yoke was a 1310, and the gear vendor's unit here takes a 1350. So I just elected to have a brand new aluminum drive shaft made. They do generally cost a little more than a steel drive shaft, but they do way less. Um, you know, if you're in a putting it in an application that's performance oriented, um, you know, a little less reciprocating mass, that type of a thing and you're losing a little weight. So two components underneath the car here need power. You've got the solenoid here, which is what engages and disengages the overdrive gear in the gear vendors. And then you have the signal generator, which basically tells the, the little controller that comes with this kit, you know, whether or not the car is moving fast enough to engage the overdrive. Moving into the car here, I need to find a spot for the controller. This is basically the brains of the operation. And then here is the wiring harness that comes with it. It hooks directly up to the controller there via this big computer looking plug. And it's got, uh, you know, a few wires here that need to be hooked up. Um, the four wires that need to go underneath the car, that is to the solenoid and to the signal generator, I'm planning, I'm probably running through this hole here that should be big enough and it's existed there since I've had the car. You know, um, now if you're doing this project, you may have to drill new holes for the the wiring to go down there and in the manual they do specify just going through the firewall and then as for the controller here um actually this is my dad's idea we were thinking we could probably just install it um sitting on top of the steering column in here that way it'll be out of the way um not too close to a heat source that's another thing they mention in the gear vendors instructions they don't want it near a heat source and then we can get power and tap our fuse panel here and we'll have good spots for a nice clean ground here at the firewall all right so this needs to be wallowed out a little bit for our grommet to fit in there and then once that is fit, we can start running the uh, wiring for the signal generator and the solenoid. Okay, so we got the grommet installed into the firewall here, and I'm just feeding the wiring for both the solenoid and the signal generator through the grommet. It will come out of the firewall you can kind of see it poking through in here. Oh, my hand was on the way. You can kind of see it poking through right there. And then I will feed it underneath the car over to the gear vendors unit. So for powering the, the system, you want to find a keyed source of power. And what that means is you don't want the unit to have power when the car is off. Um, so what you want to do is figure out what fuses do what in your fuse panel. Um, I pulled this diagram offline here for the 71 Torino. 
and tap into a fuse that will only have power when the key is on. And you'll want to verify this with a test light, which we will do here in a second. Um, so my plan was to probably tap the fuse that runs the radio windshield washer back and backup lamps because they're all fairly low draw items and so is the gear vendors in there it's only got power with the key on so now let's come down here um got the test light currently the key is off and i did tap the fuse this is the radio fuse and no power conversely we'll go over here i believe this is the fuse for the headlights again this is key off we have power so this type of fuse you probably wouldn't want to use for this unless you want the overdrive unit to always have power but i don't see why you would with the car off so now we got the key on and we got power that's what we want. Key back off. No power. You want to make sure your crimps are nice and strong. You don't want these being being weak. Um, and I do recommend um, using some shrink tubing over the connectors as well, just again to keep them sealed up nice. This one needs a little more shrinkage. We need to hook up our fuse wire here to the wiring harness, which will be right here, this one. All right, so. We got battery power there from the fuse. Got a good ground right on the firewall there. And now we're gonna have to crawl underneath the car and hook up the signal generator and the solenoid that's on the side of the gear vendors unit. All right, so we're under the car now. Um, the green and purple wires here that I'm holding in my hand will be the wires going to the signal generator here. Um, and there is no polarity to this, so it doesn't matter which wire goes where here. Um, and these will be getting the uh, little barrel connectors to fit on here. Then coming over to the overdrive unit, um, these will be getting a couple of flat connectors. Alright, so... Getting our connectors onto the solenoid here. All right, so everything's hooked up. I am going to leave the wiring slack for now. Um, we won't want this hanging, obviously, but we'll end up feeding a lot of the excess back into the cab of the vehicle and um, coiling it up neatly inside of the car. And So a dilemma I had in this project was how I was going to mount the LED indicator lights that come with this. And uh, because I didn't want to drill into the lower part of my dash, um, but I actually found this little bracket on Amazon and with the use of, uh, these grommets and a dab of super glue, um, it worked out perfect. So there's the, uh, indicator lights installed in the car and in keeping with, uh, keeping the installation kind of subtle looking, I think that worked out pretty well. Uh, my next dilemma, though, is installing the foot switch here, which will turn the overdrive on and off. Um, in the directions, they suggest just wiring up to the original dimmer switch that the lights, the headlights are hooked up to. 
I kind of prefer not to go that direction though. I think I'm gonna just install this and hook the overdrive up to this rather than hooking it up to the old dimmer switch and then hooking up my um, headlights to the new dimmer switch. And my plan of attack here is probably to cut just a little triangle approximately up here and place the switch on the floor here. I think that'll be a pretty comfortable spot for my foot, given that my foot usually is resting about here anyway, and you know, going from A to B there, not too much of a reach. So the on off switch for the overdrive is installed. Um, just need a little grommet to put over that so you can't see that I cut a little notch in the carpet. And then gonna need to uh, install the control module that came with the gear vendors and then tie up some of this wiring and just kind of double check pretty much all the work I've done on this job and it'll be time to take this thing for a test drive and see if we got overdrive. So a few weeks have gone by and I have taken the car for a test drive and the car, in fact, did not have any overdrive. So my first thought on why it may not be working is that my ground for my controller may have not been robust enough. So what I did is I made a ground right here at the solenoid where there's already a battery to frame ground well, a battery to body ground, as this is a unibody car. And then this ground runs along here, along the firewall, and then back through, and it daisy chains with my original ground. Um, tried that, that didn't solve my issue. Um, looked at the general routing of the wires, you know, the obvious stuff. You gotta start simple whenever you're dealing with a electrical issue. Um, and that all looked good to me. So now I got to investigate a little further here, actually bust out my multimeter and do some. So I've been poking around under here and I checked the, the continuity to the, of this circuit. This is the red light. And this basically just indicates that you have power. This is not illuminating when I turn the key on and depress the foot switch to turn the gear vendors on. That circuit did have continuity. Um, I put it all back together now, and that's what the, you know, what it looks like with the grommet and stuff. But anyway, I checked the circuit to the foot switch. That had continuity. And then we had continuity from the foot switch to the red light. So the next thing I wanted to look at was voltage. And that was actually, you know, maybe a sign of something being amiss. All right, so I'm going to contact my main power input to my main ground. Ah, it's kind of tricky to do. And I'm only getting about 11. Okay, I lost my contact here. Okay, 11 point three volts or so and the system is supposed to have you know 12, 12 so i went around in circles checking grounds you know finding new places to tap power from wasn't getting anywhere asked my dad to come over and take a look at it and we then we were just going around in circles together and then he decided that it would be smart to just pull the module out of the car and he wired up a little jig to power the module and then see if we could get that the red power indicator light to illuminate. And while he was doing that, he had mentioned that, you know, in in the plug that comes out of in the plug that comes out of the module here. Every, every component, the, the wires would be stacked. So, you know, in one row, you'd have your solenoid wires. Your next row would be, you know, uh, the speed sensor wires and so on. But 
we saw, we noticed that the wiring for the the red light and the wiring for the foot switch, they were kitty corner. And we were like, what the heck? Like, that's not, why is everyone else got a partner? But the circuits that were, you know, coincidentally here trying to get to work that aren't working are kitty corner coming out of the module and into this plug. So then we looked at the other side of the plug and they weren't kitty corner on the other side of the plug, meaning the foot switch wire was stack, you know, gray white on top, blue white on the bottom. Those are the wiring, the wires for the foot switch. So then we figured out that what was actually wrong was the blue wire coming out of the module and into this uh, pigtail connector, big computer looking connector was transposed with the solid blue wire um so it was just it was just miswired and i'm you know it's possible that these this big computer connector is put on by hand i don't i don't know the manufacturing process so i could totally imagine someone because they're right next to each other the blue wire and the blue wire with the white stripe are right next to each other and I could totally imagine someone, if they weren't, you know, paying close enough attention or maybe having an off day, switching those wires. Um, you know, it took a long time to to get to this point. And, you know, I know this is a little long winded, but I guess the moral of the story here is just to not take anything for granted when you're doing a big job like this. I took this for granted and I spent, I've spent countless hours chasing shadows, chasing my tail, you know, tracking down voltage, this, that, and the other, when all along, if I would have just really stared at the wiring going from this module out, out into the plug and out the plug, you know, it was so such a simple thing, but it led to uh, many hours of headaches, making phone calls, all that. So something to keep in mind if you, you know, if you're hooking one of these up and you have what happened to me go on where you're just not seemingly getting power to anything, double check that the color coding on this side of the module, or this, sorry, this side of this big computer connector looking thing is the same on the other side. I'm going to dedicate a video to the operation of the gear vendors unit and go in depth with it. But for this video, um, I'm just gonna do a quick little uh, demonstration here. I've got the gear vendors unit in the auto drive position. And basically what that does is when you reach a speed of about 40 miles an hour, maybe 45, the gear vendors switches into overdrive, which basically gives your drive line the effect of like a four speed overdrive transmission. All right, so getting to 30 miles an hour. Now pay attention to the, the lights here, because at 40 to 45, it'll switch. And there we go. We're in overdrive now. It really makes a huge difference. You know, before, you know, we're doing, you know, 55, 60 miles an hour without the gear vendors unit. The motor would be at around, you know, 2,800 to 3,000 RPM. Now, with the gear vendors unit, you know, it's doing about 2,200 RPM. So it just really makes the car a lot more flexible. But uh, again, I'm gonna do a more in-depth video of the gear vendors unit. I'm still kind of getting used to it. This is only the second time I've driven the car with the gear vendors actually working. So uh, I'm gonna sign off for now. Definitely keep an eye out for the next video. Thank you all for watching.